Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, Just in Bodhi's Opinion. My name is Bodhi and I'm gonna be talking about Origins of the Wheel of Time. It just came out and I just went straight through it. I burned through it just so that I could get through it without like any spoilers whatsoever. And I'm glad to say I didn't see any spoilers, maybe because I wasn't looking so much into Twitter. So I did want to talk about my thoughts on Origins. And I'm going to break this down into a non-spoiler review and a spoiler review. And in general, my notes are all over the place because I have feelings and I'm just going to be talking about them. If you're looking for like super well thought out outline notes, that's not me. I'm a mess, guys, and you already know that about me. Anyway, let's talk about Origins. So let's just start with my non-spoiler review. And to put it simply, I loved it. I loved this entry into the Wheel of Time collection. Other people have said this before. Michael Livingston has also said it before. This does not replace, if you see here, it does not replace the companion. It does not replace the big white book. It is a standalone by itself. And it is unique in that it is talking about the external influences into um, the Wheel of Time. And one of the great things about it is that it plays the role of, um, so I don't know what it's called with, within the Tolkien universe where um, everyone is like parsing out everything that how Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings because that's basically what Michael Livingston did. He was able to go through all the notes, go through all the stuff and help us build a map of how Robert Jordan built the world. And it was just so nice to see. So as a Wheel of Time fan myself, I of course went through all of the theories along with everyone else and, you know, looked at all the allegories and the metaphors and all the real world references of our age. And so there were parts that were familiar to me, right? Like all of the Arthurian most of the Arthurian parallels were very well known to me. And there have been like lots of different lists across. But it was so nice to see with authority the context and the explanations that Michael Livingston was making. And I'll, I'll talk about it more in my spoiler review. But there were a lot of different things that I didn't think about until Michael Livingston talked about it. Which was just like, a, it was a breath of fresh air. And I just loved seeing how it was built. I also liked the fact that Michael Livingston kind of made a biography. A biography for Robert Jordan and even for Harriet for a little bit. And it was just nice to see how everything shaped up into what we got in the end. Like, it was so nice to see that evolution. And, and he gives us from Robert Jordan's childhood, like, his father figure, I mean his father, all the way till till his death and God. So I, I, I mentioned this in a tweet and I I did tear up within what like while reading. And I won't tell you where, but I did tear up. I was not expecting it and I was like, fuck, this is giving me feelings. But yeah, so without spoiling anything, I would say it is a great addition. To, you know your wheel of time collection i think fans will love it will appreciate it and it is full spoilers it's like everything spoilers so um i recommend it only to people who have finished the books finally because they spoil like fucking everything everything which i'm not gonna spoil here but basically everything so that ends my non-spoiler review and within the next few minutes, I'm going into my spoiler review. So if you don't like spoilers, stop now, buy the book, read it, and then, you know, let's regroup afterwards. Okay, welcome to the spoiler review. And if you're still here, I am assuming that you like the spoilers or you've read it and you want to hear what I'm thinking about it. So I did not prepare like a very structured way of talking about this. I did have like a list of things I wanted to talk about and because I am a stream of consciousness guy, let's see how all of this pans out. But I'm just going to list down all the things that 
I liked, like what struck me. And we'll see if we'll have a coherent video afterwards. Okay, number one, I want to talk about how Michael Lewiston structured the entire book because I love the way he did it. I love the way that the first half was basically like explaining Robert Jordan's life, explaining the writing process, explaining how things, you know, got together, how he was thinking about it, how, and we're going to talk about it later, how the war basically shaped Robert Jordan and how he saw things, how all of the different references would have been impacting him. I love that. I love that that was the first half. And then at the 50% mark, and I can say that because I read it via Kindle, so it said 50%. After the 50% mark, it gets into the glossary. So it was companion style, except here, it's all external stuff, right? It is specifically saying that Len, who flew in the belly of an eagle to the moon, is, you know, John Glenn. And that was just so nice and refreshing to see it in official paper that that was the inspiration behind it. And again, a lot of these things we already knew, like the Trollope bands, for example, like Davol and Daemon and all of these, Afrit, all of these things that sounded like demons. We knew that that was there, or the Arthurian stuff. But the fact that it was all there as an official thing, that was cool. And I'm going to be talking about some specific things afterwards. Which gets us to my number two thing that, you know, really just struck me. Because I never really thought about it. And it was Robert Jordan's experience in the Vietnam War. Because I, I knew that he was in the war. I didn't know that he was... In so many experiences, I didn't know that he was number one being shot at and like running for his life. I didn't know that he was killing people and, you know, experiencing the traumas of war. I didn't know that. I, I guess all I thought was that he was there and then he went back. But no, like this part of life was so deeply entrenched in him. And one of the quotes that I loved was from Alan Romanchuk. Is that how to say the name? I'm sorry. So what Alan had said regarding Jordan's inclusivity, and he mentions the fact that they're like all soldiers together and the fact that like the skin color, or the eye shape, like all of that didn't matter. And maybe I'll just read straight from it because he says, and then maybe the situation gets more serious. You kill your first Charlie. Maybe you can see the dead kid, no older than you, with a slightly different skin tone from you and eyes of a different shape. But... Someone trying to do his job just like you are. That's when the barrier is shattered. A switch flips. Dead boy isn't the G or F devil or the enemy. Not what they told you. He's just, except for a few superficial differences, a human like you. You're torn up inside if you're sane and there's a shred of decency in your heart, but you have a lot of time left in this war. So to cope, you lock the soft, vulnerable part of yourself away until your tour of duty is up. There's time for compassion later, if there is a later. Then you get home and your biggest struggle becomes how do you become normal again? How do you cleanse the taint that fills you? I mean, I don't know. That that just struck me. Also, it went back to all of the times that Jordan talked about the taint and how uh, it was a corrupting influence and you felt like everything that you touched was dirty. And I don't know. That was That was just eye-opening to me. Also with the fact that Robert Jordan has killed people. <laughs> like, I didn't know. And the thing was, he was processing that trauma. He was processing that and he built a world where the main character was processing trauma as well. And I'm glad, you know, he didn't brush off all of that trauma. He, he used that trauma and built the world that we are all living in. Number three, one of the things that really struck me and made me tear up was... Um, Robert Jordan's death and how it was written. I don't know. I'm feeling a theory just talking about it, but I came into the fandom late, meaning I came into the fandom at Winter's Heart. And like most people, once the book started spacing out, I, you know, read other books, read other things. I didn't know much about like how Robert Jordan passed away. I just knew that he did. And I was like, oh my God. But reading through it, reading how Team Jordan was there, typing it all out, writing it all down, just in case he got better. And then after that, just in case to 
have all of that those notes for the next person to write it that was just it was just i have no words because i didn't realize and when i saw it you know written down it just made me glad that i became part of it and michael livingston just writes it so well and again i'm gonna put a quote maria who knew the wheel of time better than anyone was working through a list of still unanswered questions that the team had written down she spent time with him on friday september 14 taking notes as he chose the winner of a calendar art contest for tour she wanted to ask him about some of the remaining questions on her list but he was clearly tired and needed rest she marked her place on the page of queries she'd get her answers when she came back on monday the chance never came james oliver rigney jr quietly slipped away at 2.45 on Sunday, September 16, 2007. His last words were a whisper of love to his wife. Okay. Anyway, give me a moment. Yeah, that struck me. And then with Harriet's letter and notes and all those things, I was just, oh my God. (sighs) Emotions. And so now maybe switching to more specific things. And related to the questions that Maria was asking for, one of the things that she was not able to ask was the how did Rand light the pipe? We didn't get the answer to that. I didn't. Ah. And again, I'm just going into a quote. One of the questions that Maria never got to ask Jordan, the next one on her list on that Friday before he passed, was about the final moment in the series. How did Rand light his pipe the answer to this and everything else now felt to brandon and team jordan (laughs) oh and then the words before this was there wasn't a full outline there wasn't a sequenced plot most of the puzzles had only pieces of the solution which which just again goes to show how daunting that task was and i'm so happy that brandon sanderson got to step in and do that like he did that right after he just did mistborn that was his only writing chop at that point in time oh my god but just thinking of that enormity of that task just boggles my mind but still so how did rand light the pipe we don't know we can still theorize okay getting into very specific things one of the things that i really 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 loved was the fact that moraine was supposed to be a stand-in gandalf right but she was based among other things she was also based on merlin and in the beginning robert jordan had wanted her to be a merlin right a merlin and then you know as it went along he split that character into Swan and Moraine. Now, why am I talking about this? Because he also split the Merlin character into Tom Marilyn, right? Hang on with me. In the glossary, it says, Jordan split Merlin into pieces. The two most prominent was Moraine and Tom. Their union at the end of the Wheel of Time is just a microcosm of what happened in the course of the series. It brings the male and female halves of Merlin together, blah, 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 blah. So why am I so into that? It's because the other split of the Merlin piece was Swan, which just goes to show, again, also the microcosm of the unity back of the Merlin piece. And if we're going by themes and putting together, you know, Merlin back together, we can have Merlin um, doing each other. We can have Merlin by Swan and Moray. So I just love that. I love the fact that, you know, again, in another turning of the wheel, they were lovers and they're still lovers. Okay, next one I wanted to talk about is the binary. And what I love about Michael Livingston is that he is not writing in a bubble. He knows what's happening in the fandom. He knows what is also happening in the larger world outside. And I love the fact that we have a conversation about binaries because he does acknowledge it that, you know, in the context of today, the binaries might be a bit problematic to some people, especially to people who do not, you know, fall within the binary. And one of the great things that Michael Levinson talks about, first of all, he surmises that if Robert Jordan were living today, he would probably be more inclusive to all of the different things. But Also, he points out that, again, in the end, we are living in a thematic world where 
we never know the full extent of the truth. We don't know the truth, truth. Everything we know is limited by perspective. And it is the perspective of the characters within their current binary. But that doesn't mean that's the whole truth. And I love the fact that, again, it is within the theme of the Wheel of Time. And that's what I love about the Wheel of Time. Because it is not a structure that cannot be questioned. And that's why the discussion is so alive today. And that's why there are so many fans, you know, on both sides of the equation who are still debating on many things about the Wheel of Time. And that's why there are so many content creators who are still talking about the Wheel of Time. Because we can. We can talk about it. Because within this framework, we can talk about it. So I, I love that part. I love the fact that he does acknowledge it and talk about it. Even our most enlightened characters are still limited in what they're capable of knowing. Their understanding of the world is demonstrably incomplete, and so is ours. Ages turn, the world changes, Rand lit the pipe. Okay, some few other things. One of the things that super struck me was the fact that Gentling used to be, like in, in Robert Jordan's mind while doing it, Gentling was supposed to be gelding before. And if you don't know what gelding means, it means, you know, cutting off the balls, right? Castrating. Gelding is castrating, right? <laughs> so before, to gentle a man, you gelded him, castrated him. And I guess that's what gelding metaphorically does. I mean, gelding. Gentling. Gentling metaphorically castrates the man's power. The fact that it used to be physically castrating him, it's just mind-boggling. I'm glad that <laughs> it did it wasn't that another thing that completely sailed past my mind was the fact that althor was a transliteration of arthur i did not think of that i saw arthur pendrag and i thought that's arthur pendragon and i didn't even think oh althor is arthur and again michael levison does talk about how it's not everything's not one parallel right there are many parallels but i i never thought about althor Al arthur but now every time i say it i'm like oh arthur so speaking of names i love the fact that there are a lot of references a lot of different things in legend in myth whatever but one of the things that i love was the fact that not, not everything was a deep symbolism to something so we're talking about the gen Aiel, and we're talking about all of the Aiel. And they were talking about the parallels of the 12 tribes of Israel and all these things. And then we get to the Gen Aiel. And then it says, their name, as it happens, derived from the Gen air stove in Jordan's kitchen. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and finally, I guess in my number 10, I'm not sure. I'll put the countdown somewhere here. He talks about the Shan Chan accent. Which which has always confounded me. I was always like, why do they sound like Texans? And I don't know, maybe people know this already. But in the glossary, it says, Though meant to recall America and the location of their land, which is west across the ocean, and their practice of slavery, to the point that he suggested that they had a Southern American accent. So Robert Jordan made the slave owners in the Wheel of Time, he gave them all a Southern American accent to evoke that to, I guess, their American readers. I don't know. I don't feel it. Okay, so those were some of my very rambly thoughts about origins. There's a lot of things. I think I need to do a reread because I just burned through all of it. But those were some of my thoughts. I would really invite people who read the, the origins also to comment down below. Let me know what you thought. I've obviously missed many things but did i miss anything on the things i talked about what did you like about it? what struck you as well let me know down in the comments i'm just really happy we got like a nicely written book it also made me want to read up on michael livingston and his books so maybe i'll check that out after i read the expanse but yeah so those were my thoughts for now let me know down in the comments what you thought please like and subscribe join my discord support me on patreon and i'll see you next time Somebody's opinion